So today we're going to be talking about our final type of market structure, which is monopoly. So we've talked about perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, and our last one is monopoly. So even though few firms overall are monopolies, the economic model can be quite useful. As we've seen previously, even though com perfectly competitive markets are rare, the competitive market model provides kind of a benchmark for how a firm acts when it's in an industry such as farming. So um, on the other hand, or the other side of it, things, Monopoly provides a benchmark for the other extreme where the firm is like the only one in the industry and doesn't face any competition from other firms. And so essentially the Monopoly is model is also kind of good to look at when analyzing situations in which firms may agree to collude or like not compete. Um, and we'll kind of discuss a little bit um, what happens if they're able to act together as monopoly. Um, uh, we're also going to talk about in this chapter how collusion itself is illegal in the U.S., but it occasionally happens. So overall, we're just going to quickly define kind of what a monopoly is. So a monopoly, it's a market structure. consisting of one firm that is the only seller of a good or service that does not have a close substitute. So essentially, like I said, monopoly exists on the opposite side of the competitive um, or competition spectrum as comparison to perfect competition. And so um, again, we're studying it for two reasons. Some firms are truly monopolists, so it's under important to understand how they behave. And then other, sit another situation is in which firms may collude to act like a monopolist. So when thinking about um, do monopolies really exist, um, think about is if you lived in a small town that only had one pizzeria, um, is that pizzeria a monopoly? Um, well, you have to think about it has competition potentially from other fast food re restaurants. And then it also has competition from grocery stores. So if we think about these alternatives as close substitutes for the pizzeria place, then it wouldn't be a considered a monopoly. But if you don't consider them to be close substitutes, then it would be considered a monopoly. So regardless, either way, um, the unique position of the pizzeria may afford it some monopoly power um, to raise prices and obtain economic profit. So let's talk about next kind of where do monopolies come from. So again, there's four main reasons um, monopolies exist due to these barriers of entry. So the first one being uh, government restrictions on in the, excuse me, government restrictions on entry. The second one being control of a key resource. The third being ex network externalities. And the fourth being a natural monopoly. And we'll kind of get into um, each one of these individually. So when it comes to um, the first one, um, government restrictions, we're going to want to think about the idea of that the U.S. government may block entry into an industry in two main ways. One being patents, copyrights, and trademarks. So um, essentially when newly developed products such as drugs are being developed, they are going to be granted patents, which are exclusive rights to produce <coughs> excuse me produce a product for 20 years mm 
from the patent filing date. Kind of similarly, copyright, they're again providing an exclusive right. to produce and sell creative works for example we're going to think about um, books and films and then we can also think about um, trademarks, which are they're offering protection for brand names, brand names, symbols, and some characteristics. So essentially, these intellectual property protections are encouraging innovation and creativity. Um, without them, essentially, firms are going to have a harder time covering high fixed costs. So um, if we think about kind of in today's coronavirus kind of crisis that's going on, um, there are drug companies, biotech firms that are competing in order to come up with potentially a vaccine or, you know, a type of drug or medicine that's going to help combat some of the symptoms. And so whoever is the first to kind of um, come up with, with a solution or um, a potential solution, they would obviously be filing for a patent in order to... Um, essentially cover some of their fixed costs if it is successful um, within the market. So kind of another way that the U.S. government can block entries is through public franchises. So what a public franchise is, it, um, it's a government designation that a certain firm is the only legal provider of a good or service. So in this case, um, we can think about um, like state and local governments. They're often, they designate one company as like the sole provider of electricity, natural gas, or water. Uh, kind of another example would be um, the U.S. postal system. So we can think about um, electricity, natural gas, water, the U.S. Postal Service, so obviously the U.S. Postal Service, they have the exclusive right to deliver first class mail. Okay, so the next one that we 
kind of barrier entry of entry that we talked about in the oligopoly chapter was the control of a key resource. So um, we'll kind of get into it a little bit more here, but for a long time, uh, the Aluminum Company of America, Alcoa, they had um, owned or had long-term contracts for almost all of the world's supply of, um, of bauxite. which is a mineral that we can use to make aluminum. And then um, another kind of example would be um, the NFL. So the NFL, they act in a monopoly kind of in this manner as well because they're able to kind of ensure that the majority of the world's best players are going to be under contract to the NFL um, rather than another league. We could also think about, um, as far as collegiate athletes go, the NCAA would be controlling of kind of that resource that they have. So in that sense of collegiate athletes, that's really um, the number one organization that you're wanting to be a part of. And then also, we can also think about De Beers Diamonds. So, that's kind of one of the most famous monopoly examples um, based on the control of a raw material is the De Beers Diamond Monopoly. Um, essentially, they're what they did was try to control as much of the supply of diamonds as possible so they could keep their prices really high. But um, a couple decades ago, um, new competitors around the world had started to erode their um, control of the diamond production. So it kind of reduced their monopoly power. The next thing we're gonna talk about are network externalities. So what a network externality is, it's a product characteristic whereby the usefulness of the product increases as the number of consumers who use it increases. So some examples of these would be like auction sites such as eBay I don't know if any of y'all still use eBay, um, social network sites. Think about TikTok. Also, we can think about um, like Venmo not really a social networking site but essentially as more people use it the, the usefulness of it increases however kind of the problem with the network externality um, is that essentially a firm is able to you know allow the value of its product to increase along with the price it could charge as well so but and then 
while the firm's able to do that, consumers are going to be locked into an inferior product. Last thing um, would be a natural monopoly. So what a natural monopoly is, it occurs when economies of scale, which we'll we talked about in the oligopoly chapter, are so large one firm can supply the entire market can't spell today entire market at a lower average cost than two or more firms. So when we think about natural monopolies, we're going to be thinking about firms in which they have high fixed costs. Um, so we can think about kind of, again, going back to the public franchises. Um, we have electricity, water, sewer, those type of utility companies, um, it takes a high amount of capital fixed cost to lay the sewer lines, um, put up the electric lines, transformers, etc. Um, another another thing you can think about would be um, a rural hospital. So it might not be cost efficient to have multiple large hospitals serving one rural area. Um, and so there, one hospital may have a natural monopoly if they're able to produce at a lower average cost than having two of them. Okay, so when we talked about oligopolies, we didn't really talk about the idea of marginal cost versus marginal revenue, because remember in oligopolies, it was all about that strategic interaction between the firms. And so that mattered more, the interdependence and interaction between the firms mattered more than marginal cost and marginal revenue. But monopolists, they don't have any competitors. And there's therefore, there, there is no concern about any strategic interactions. So they're gonna seek to maximize profit by choosing a quantity to produce, just like perfect and monopolistic competitors. And so monopolies are in fact very, very similar to monopolistic competitors in the fact that they face a downward sloping demand curve. Um, the difference is the barriers to enter um, will prevent other firms from competing away their economic profit. So monopolies, they're going to maximize profit when MR equals MC. Does that sound familiar? It should be by now, hopefully. Um, and again, they're going to be facing a downward sloping demand curve. But as you can see, as a monopolist decreases price to expand outfit, to expand output, two effects are going to occur. Revenue increases from selling an additional unit of output, and then revenue decreases because the price reduction is shared within or with existing customers. So again, just like monopolistic competition, the monopolist is going to have a 
marginal revenue curve that is below the demand curve. So again, since we're going to be maximizing profits, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, we're going to use the MR equals MC um, condition to determine the quantity. So remember, we have MR equals MC. So that's Q. So where MR equals MC, determine Q. And then we're going to use the demand curve to determine price so we're going to go up to again staying on the sidewalk up to the demand curve and then we're going to determine our price if I had an average total cost curve on here we would use ATC to determine average cost and then we could use our price and our average total cost price Price minus average total cost times quantity. Equals profit. So as you can see, a monopoly is very similar to monopolistic competition. So since the important thing about monopoly is since there aren't barriers to entry, additional firms can't enter the market. So there's going to be no distinction between a long run and a short run for a monopoly. Um, so therefore, unlike monopolistic competition, we're going to expect monopolists to earn profits in the long run. They're, they're going to continue to earn profits in the long run. So now let's talk about whether or not a monopoly reduces economic efficiency. So you here in the news or in general, anytime you hear the word monopoly, you tend to have a negative connotation towards it. And so what I'm going to do is actually kind of show you why you would have a negative connotation towards um, a monopoly when you hear it being talked about. So um, suppose we're going to suppose that a market could be characterized by either perfect competition or monopoly and kind of determine which one would be better. So um, we're going to kind of look at the comparison between perfect competition and monopoly or what happens if a perfectly competitive firm or industry became a monopoly. So the example on the PowerPoint kind of talks about the market for smartphones. So essentially, we're supposing we're using this example um, and going to suppose that the market for smartphones is perfectly competitive. And then one firm buys up all of, of the smartphones in the country. So we're going to look at what happens to kind of the price of smartphones, the quantity of smartphones traded, kind of the consumer surplus, producer surplus, and overall economic surplus or benefit to all of society. So the first thing we're going to look at would be um, a, like the perfectly competitive side of things. So we're going to just draw a perfectly competitive market. So keep in mind, um, this is going to be perfect competition. 
So with perfect competition, this is for the industry as a whole. The industry as a whole does have a downward sloping demand curve. And then we have an, let's do it in blue, an upward sloping supply curve. So therefore, we have equilibrium quantity. It's going to be your Q PC, your quantity at perfect competition, and your price at perfect competition. However, now looks, let's look at what would happen is if this became a monopoly. So if this became a monopoly, we would carry over and have a downward sloping demand curve. Remember that our marginal cost curve is actually our supply curve. So we're gonna have an upward sloping marginal cost curve. We're gonna do that in green. So we have an upward sloping marginal cost curve. So the marginal cost curve for the monopoly, we'll label this, is going to be identical to the old supply curve. However, but the new firm is going to maximize market profit and produce where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So we didn't draw a marginal revenue curve in, but we're gonna do that. If we draw a marginal revenue curve, that's downward sloping, we're going to see we're actually going to be, we'd be producing here for quantity perfect competition, but we would be producing here for quantity monopoly. Our price for that so it's not so this would be our price for perfect competition however for the price for a monopoly remember we're gonna go all the way up to the demand curve to determine the price for the monopoly so the price for the monopoly is going to be higher than the price for the perfectly competitive industry. So we notice here that perfect competition produces at a lower price and a higher quantity, but monopoly produces at a higher price and lower quantity. So we can see we have a higher price, lower quantity for monopoly, but we have a lower price and higher quantity for perfect competition. So let's kind of look at it again, but this time we're going to be looking at it from the consumer and producer surplus standpoint. So again, here we have perfect competition on the left, and we have monopoly on the right. <laughs> Downward sloping demand curve, upward sloping supply curve, we have our price perfect competition, quantity perfect competition, So in identifying producer and super consumer surplus for the perfect competition graph, we had 
Um, remember, consumer surplus was everything above the price but below the demand curve. So this would be consumer surplus. And then producer surplus was everything below the price but above the supply curve. So we'll just indicate these in two different colors. Consumer surplus is gonna be in yellow. And then we're gonna shade producer surplus in this green. Okay, so now let's look at a monopoly. So again, with the monopoly, we had a downward sloping demand curve. We had an upward sloping marginal cost curve. So we had our price perfect competition, quantity perfect competition that we carried over. However, in this case, we need to put in our downward, for the monopoly, we need to put a downward sloping marginal revenue curve. Therefore, we're going to see our quantity monopoly lower and our price it's going to be higher for the monopoly so therefore when we're looking at consumer surplus which is everything above the price but below the demand curve everything above the price but below the demand curve is this triangle right here okay and then Remember, looking at producer surplus, it's going to be everything below the price and above the supply curve, or in this case, the marginal cost curve. So we gained all of this as consume. This is all of this is consumer surplus, or excuse me, producer surplus. So this is consumer surplus up here, and this is producer surplus, everything in green. However, we have this little triangle of, let's put this in pink. It's familiar of dead weight loss. And we also have an area that this area right here that was that was transfer of consumer surplus to producer surplus. So we can see here the differences between the economic surplus of uh, both perfect competition and monopoly. So you're maximizing total surplus with perfect competition. 
So obviously we don't have any deadweight loss with the perfect competition. However, with the monopoly, because they are cutting back on the quantity that they are producing and they're charging a higher overall price, so we have a higher price and we've cut back on the quantity, we are not going to be maximizing surplus. Um, and so, essentially, that's, we're proving why, um, overall, economic surplus or well-being is reduced. because of deadweight loss. And then you can see, instead of the consumers maximizing um, their benefit, as they would have done in perfect competition, um, cons consumer surplus is reduced and the producers, or the monopolist in this case, is gain picking up this whole extra square that I've marked with the black um, lines of consumer surplus, then it's trans transferred to producers. Okay. So overall, um, economists kind of estimate that the loss of efficiency in the U.S. due to like this market power that um, monopolists have is probably less than 1% of U.S. total production. Um, so deadweight loss due to market power is relatively small. And I guess I didn't define market power for y'all, so I'm going to just put it down here. Market power, it's the ability of a firm to charge a price greater greater than marginal cost so we can see up here in this graph the monopolist is charging a price that is higher than marginal cost. So the final thing that we're gonna talk about within monopolies are the ideas of government policy towards monopolies. So because monopolies, we've proved that reduce consumer surplus and overall economic efficiencies, governments attempt to regulate their behavior. So many governments, they try to stop firms colluding and they're trying to prevent mergers and acquisitions to create large firms through what are called antitrust laws. Um, so let's talk about kind of collusion itself. What is collusion? It's an agreement... among firms to charge the same price or otherwise not compete. And then we have antitrust laws, which there are laws aimed at eliminating collusion and promoting competition among firms So kind of back in the 1870s and 1880s, several trusts kind of had fir 
formed, which are their boards of trustees that oversaw operations of several firms within an industry and enforce kind of collusive agreements. And so um, in response, the federal government kind of responded with antitrust laws that you might have learned about in your history class to limit this anti-competitive behavior. Some examples of those would be like the Sherman Act that was enacted in 1890, which kind of prohibited restraint of trade, including price fixing and collusion. And then um, like the Clayton Act in 1914, which was prohibiting firms from buying stock in its competitors and from having directors serve on the boards of competing firms. Um, these are just a few examples of um, just uh, some antitrust laws. Um, there was a recent kind of question whether or not generic drug firms have been colluding over time to raise prices. Um, so drugs in which the patent has expired are called generic drugs, and so these make up about 88% of U.S. prescriptions, but um, kind of there's intense competition within the generic drug market, which is commonly resulted in lower prices for generic drugs. But that means that firms have a strong incentive to break antitrust laws and collude in order to try to raise prices. And so um, kind of big farm has been under scrutiny a lot um, over recent years with regards to um, antitrust investigations and then also in kind of the opioid epidemic as well. I highly suggest you watch The Pharmacist on Netflix if you haven't. It was actually a really interesting perspective as far as like healthcare and kind of healthcare economics. But um, the last two things I kind of want to talk about would be the antitrust laws that are covering mergers, particularly what horizontal and vertical mergers are. So horizontal mergers, these are mergers between firms in the same industry versus vertical mergers are between two firms in different industries. Well, not necessarily different industry, but different stages of production. So both of these types of mergers, they usually enhance a firm's market power overall. Um, essentially, what happens is when a merger occurs, um, increasing the price from the competitive price to the monopoly price results in deadweight loss. So overall, again, um, you can use the, um, there's several different types of ways to check the concentration of industries um, and market shares to see if, um, uh, it'd be considered a monopoly. We kind of referred to one of those in the oligopoly chapter, the four firm concentration ratio. Um, one, the one used for monopolies is called the herfindahl hirschman index, the HHI index, and that squares the percentage of market shares for each firm and adds up the results. Um, but I think that about wraps up what I want to talk about for monopolies. Again, um, I will be putting up a, a worksheet as well as an answer key um, for monopolies. It's very, very similar, as you can see on these graphs, to monopolistically competitive firms. However, um, again, kind of the key takeaway from a monopoly is the fact that the industry demand curve for monopoly is the same as the individual firm demand curve because there's only one company within the entire industry. And so if you have questions or comments or concerns about this chapter, just feel free to let me know and um, we can work through that.